Welcome again to your chapter 10 video lecture series where we're going to talk about section 10.3 on physiology of skeletal muscle contraction. So we talked about our neuromuscular junction that calcium entered the synaptic knob and told our synaptic vesicles with the acetylcholine in it to exocytose and allow that acetylcholine to bind to the acetylcholine receptors. In this way, we're going to have thousands of those acetylcholine molecules released from about 300 vesicles. And that acetylcholine, like we said, diffuses through that synaptic cleft and will bind to its receptors. And this excites our muscle fiber. Now we need to talk about a clinical view here of myasthenia gravis. This is an autoimmune disease and it's found primarily in women where we're going to have antibodies bind to the acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction. Our receptors removed by muscle fibers through endocytosis. And then we're going to see that we have a result as decreased muscle stimulation. This is going to cause rapid fatigue and muscle weakness, which you could see mostly within the eyes or facial muscles because they are involved first. And it may be followed with issues of swallowing and other limb weaknesses. So if you look at this illustration over here, we covered how our acetylcholine neurotransmitter is going to bind to its receptor and that allows sodium ions to move into our muscle cell. But here we see that an antibody has binded itself to our acetylcholine receptor and because of that it blocked where acetylcholine can bind and it doesn't allow sodium to move in. So that's why we have our decreased muscle stimulation because now we can't get that action potential to propagate down the sarcolemma, move down the T-tubule, which will cause release of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the calcium release from sarcoplasmic reticulum to bind to actin. So we are in our phase of excitation contraction coupling. We need to stimulate our fiber that will be coupled with the sliding filaments in just a moment. Coupling is going to include an end plate potential or an EPP, a muscle action potential, and release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we are going to walk through all of these phases. We'll start with our end plate potential or EPP. Acetylcholine is going to bind to its receptor this is chemically a chemically gated channel, acetylcholine being our chemical or agonist that is binding to the receptor. When it's bound, it is active and that channel will open and sodium will move into the cell while our potassium is going to diffuse out. When this happens, our cell membrane is briefly going to become less negative. So that's what we're seeing down over here. This graph is showing us our voltage here um, through the unit of mini volts. And this is just time moving in the y-axis, which isn't really pictured here. But this little bump that we see is a little change to become more positive and is called a miniature EPP. So that is not going to be enough to give us an action potential. But then if our EPP is local and doesn't lead to the opening of our voltage-gated ion channels in the adjacent region of our sarcolemma, it just goes back to its resting membrane potential. Then let's say we get a little bit larger EPP. We get that stimulation of a nerve, right? Um, allowing sodium to move into the cell. And look, we have an increase of 5 millivolts. So maybe from negative 90, we moved to negative 85. We became more positive. 
that still is not enough to cause an action potential or depolarization. So then we have to cause more stimulation and we stimulate, get that nerve to stimulate the muscle and we are going to reach our threshold, which is going to be different for every cell. Let's just say it's negative 65 millivolts for our skeletal muscle cell here. And once we get to that voltage level of negative 55, that's when this action potential skyrockets because we are going to open up those voltage-gated sodium channels that'll allow a ton of sodium to move in through um, adjacent regions of the sarcolemma, and that's how propagation is going to take place. So here it is, that initiation and propagation of action potential along the sarcolemma and the T-tubule. So we're looking right over here. There are, um, let's talk about our previous phase where that acetylcholine attached, it allowed a little bit of sodium to move in, causing our EPP. So Oh, here's the amount that they are giving us. So we were at a resting state of negative 90 millivolts, and that EPP made us go to negative 65 millivolts. So at this point, we have reached threshold, and we are going to get something called depolarization to take place. And when we reach threshold, these purple voltage-gated sodium channels are all going to open up. So what does that mean? That means I'm gonna get more and more positive ions inside my cell. So it's going to become even more positive and reach positive 30 millivolts. So that action from moving to, from negative 65 millivolts to positive 35 millivolts is called depolarization. Now, once we reach that positive 30 millivolts, it's kind of our end cap, then all of those voltage-gated sodium channels are going to close, and the ones next to it will open up because that sodium that it let in starts to move across the sarcolemma to other regions. We sense that voltage change, and the other sodium channels will open up, so that action potential will propagate and move down. So it's a chain reaction as it's moving down the sarcolemma, and eventually we will reach the T-tubule. So I just want to refer to this graph over here. This is showing us our resting membrane potential, so we're going back to the beginning. We're at negative 90 millivolts here. We had an EPP that allowed us to reach threshold at negative 65 millivolts, and that caused a depolarization, and we reached positive 30 millivolts. Our action potential took place, and then now our sodium voltage-gated channels are going to close, and our voltage-gated potassium channels are going to open. So when those potassium-gated channels open up, it's going to allow for potassium to move out of the cell. And so those potassium channels are positive, right? And by it moving out of the cell, we are going to become more negative. And so we're gonna call this phase repolarization. And our job is to try to get back to our resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts. This repolarization is then going to propagate down the membrane and our T-tubules as well. Notice how in this illustration we also see a hyperpolarization. Sometimes that potassium door is slow to close and we lose too much potassium, but then by using our sodium-potassium pump, it kind of sets the rhythm back so that we can reach our resting membrane potential. And while this is all taking place, we are in something called a refractory period, meaning that we are so busy dealing with all of this that we're gonna be unable to respond to another stimulation. And here's our full scale view of excitation contraction coupling. We had the um, acetylcholine neurotransmitters leave these 
vesicles and attach to their receptors at the motor end plate. Those receptors opened up, allowed sodium to move in, making the inside of our cell more positive. We got that end plate potential when we became more positive, right? We moved from our resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts to negative 65 millivolts, which is our threshold. So once that threshold was met, we entered depolarization, which allowed all of our sodium channels to open up, allowing the inside to become more positive. So we moved from negative 65 millivolts to positive 30 millivolts. And then after that, our sodium voltage gated channels closed and our potassium gated channels opened, allowing potassium to leave, which made the inside of our cell more negative. So we are moving in repolarization from positive 30 millivolts to our resting membrane potential at negative 90 millivolts. And here are some of the events in a graph form. So just as we indicated earlier, resting membrane potential at 90, here's our EPP taking place. So we're moving from negative 90 to our threshold at negative 65. Then we move into depolarization. So here at this point, our sodium gated channels open and we get lots of sodium in and in making us more positive. Depolarization is taking place. We've reached our action potential, and we're going to get that action potential to move down the sarcolemma. But at this point, the location that we're at, the sodium-gated channels close, potassium-gated channels open, and the potassium leaves the inside of the cell. So we're going to become more and more negative through repolarization, and we are moving from positive 30 millivolts back down to negative 90 millivolts. Now, we said that action potential is going to propagate, right? So that action potential is going to move down the T-tubule. And this is now going to cause our voltage-gated sensitive calcium channels in the T-tubule to trigger the opening, lost my mouse there, of our calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisternae here. That release of calcium from the SR is going to move on out so that it can interact with our myofilament, specifically that actin myofilament, to trigger contraction. And now we're going to enter into our cross bridge cycle. So this is our third physiological event in muscle contraction. And what we'll see is that calcium will move down from that sarcoplasmic reticulum to bind to troponin. Remember troponin, how it reminded me of the word triple? That's because we're going to have one of the units binding to tropomyosin, our jump rope. Another subunit will bind to our actin filament. And then that third subunit is going to bind to calcium. So when calcium binds to troponin, Troponin is able to shift tropomyosin so that it can expose these myosin binding sites. Now, why do we want that to take place? It's so we can get our cross bridge cycling to take place through four repeating steps. Our first step is for that cross bridge formation to take place. So our myosin head is going to bind to the exposed myosin binding sites on the actin because we were able to shift this tropomyosin out of the way. This green jump rope tropomyosin, when the calcium isn't bound, is covering. Let me see if I could find this photo. Oh, it's pretty a long way away. So this is a good photo that shows us that tropomyosin. Do you see how it's covering up those myosin binding sites? Calcium is not attached to troponin here, so they stay covered so contraction can't take place. So now that we have that myosin head attached to our actin, we are going to want to perform a power stroke or a pull. 
our myosin head is going to pull that thin filament toward the center of the sarcomere. So if you're looking at this image here, the myosin head attached and pulled all of these actin filaments in toward this M line on this side over here. Whereas on this side, we're pulling the actin myofilaments in this way toward the M line. And when that's taking place, our ADP and inorganic phosphate is going to be released. Notice how it's attached here in the attachment phase or the cross bridge formation. So our next step then is going to be for this myosin head to release. And in order to do that, we need ATP. If you think back to when I first introduced myosin to you, we had an ATP binding site. So ATP binds here and that allows the myosin head to release. Next, we need the myosin head to reset. So ATP splits into ADP and inorganic phosphate by using our enzyme myosin ATPase. And that allows us to have energy to cock the myosin head back so it can prepare to reattach. And this cycle will happen over and over again in order to move those actin filaments toward the M line to get full contraction. And as long as that calcium is present, we will continue doing that cycle over and over again. Another thing we need present is ATP. So here's our relaxed sarcomere, and down here you could see our contracted sarcomere. And what we're seeing is obviously our sar sarcomere has shortened. So if we look at our sarcomere, which is Z disc to Z disc here, you see the length of our relaxed sarcomere versus the length of our fully contracted sarcomere from Z disc to Z disc. So the Z discs are moving closer together. Another thing that we see taking place over here is a disappearance of that H zone. Remember that H lighter zone in here where we had no actin filaments present, only the myosin filaments. It's disappeared here because we have overlapping of those actin filaments over the myosin. And another thing we see is a disappearance of those I bands where we only had our thin filaments present. Those thin filaments moved in toward the M line, so we don't have that space where only the actin filaments are found. And notice how our thick and thin filaments are remaining the same length. They're just sliding past each other. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Here's just one more video to show you how muscle contraction at the sarcomere takes place. In a relaxed muscle, actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side, and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins are pulled toward the center of each myosin myofilament. As a result, the sarcomeres shorten. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap, the H zones disappear, and the I band becomes very narrow. And now for a clinical view regarding muscle contraction.
With the disease tetanus, we have spastic paralysis that's going to be caused from a toxin from a bacterium known as Clostridium tenati. What this bacterium does is um, it's going to block the release of an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the spinal cord that results in overstimulation of the muscles. And we do get vaccinations in order to prevent this life-threatening condition. And then we have botulism. This is a muscular paralysis that's also caused by a toxin, but this time from a different bacterium. Still the same um, genera, Clostridium, but different species. It's botulinium. And this is going to prevent the release of acetylcholine at the synaptic knob. So if you're already thinking, well, we need acetylcholine for muscle contraction, you are correct. So although the toxin ingestion can be life-threatening, careful injections of it can treat uh, conditions such as spasticity, like spas uh, spasms due to cerebral palsy, or for cosmetic procedures such as reducing wrinkles like we see here. But in other cases where it has been ingested, um, for instance, this woman in, I believe this was Sacramento or San Francisco, I can't remember now, but she um, ate chips and nachos from a gas station and uh, she ended up coming down with botulism and had difficulties breathing, um, because her diaphragm was no longer contracting or her uh, respiratory muscles were having difficulties. Um, and I tried to figure out if uh, she fully recovered, but I could not find any news regarding that. But there were four other individuals that became ill from that same food at that gas station. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about in this section is muscle relaxation. So once we have that nerve signal stop, acetylcholine will no longer be released from the motor neuron, and we will have hydrolysis of acetylcholine, like we saw in that video a while ago, by acetylcholine esterase. So it breaks down acetylcholine, and we're able to recruit um, the broken down molecules in order to make acetylcholine again, kind of like recycling it. And we're going to have closure of these acetylcholine receptors, so we are no longer bringing in sodium, sodium into the muscle cell. Therefore, we won't have an action potential take place. We'll see that the uh, calcium channels are going to close in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so all of this calcium will be reabsorbed and put back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And in order to do this, we need ATP, and we will return troponin back to its original shape so that the tropomyosin will once again block those myosin binding sites. And with all of these processes in place, we can return the muscle back to its original position because of its elasticity.